We thank the Lord for another opportunity to be here this morning. Good to see again a good number uh, here. Let's turn back to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. <clears throat> Thankful I had uh, one of my members from Sunflower able to come up this morning, Sister Ruth Bond. Thankful she's here. I know that others visiting with us this morning. I know that the church is glad to have you. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, this week, that uh, for those of you maybe that would be visiting for the first time this morning, that uh, in the morning services that uh, have felt led uh, to take some thoughts out of the epistle that Paul wrote to this dear beloved church there at Philippi. And I won't go back through everything we've said. We didn't just go to a lot of details uh, concerning uh, his relationship with the church, just uh, hit the high points of uh, how that the church was uh, established upon his mission work. And we'd look maybe Sunday afternoon at some of that on his second missionary journey that he would travel there. And um, that there would be some that would be one to the Lord, a, a woman uh, named Lydia and uh, a jailer and his family and uh, possibly a demon-possessed girl. And, and from that, that they became very dear uh, to the Apostle Paul. They were special to him. And uh, I, I don't really just know how to express this uh, as, as to people or as, as believers that we're to love all men, we're to do good to all men, especially them of the household of faith, the Bible tells us. And yet there's just people as you go down through the scenes of life, uh, whether it be as a pastor, or whether it just be as, uh, I don't like to term lay members, but uh, whether you're a pastor or not, th th there's just some people that become very special to you. Uh, just from a standpoint of a pastor, you go to a church and uh, you love all the people of that church the same. You must, if you're going to be an effective pastor. There's some you just get closer to. There's some that uh, just become very dear to you. There's places that become just very dear to you. And the church at Philippi was one of these places for the Apostle Paul. They'd gone out of their way uh, to love him, to support him, uh, to um, maintain communication with him, encourage him uh, in every way. And so as he writes this letter back to them, there's a lot of thoughts. There's many thoughts that you uh, can get here. And um, I think we took about a year to go through this book where I, at, at Sunflower a couple of years ago, right after I went uh, on Sunday night, just for a whole year, just going through this book. And, and you could go back and start over, Brother Trent, and go, go another year, not cover the same things again. The Word of God's rich if you'll dig into it. That's why so many people, they fail to understand, they fail to see the, the richness and the joy in studying God's Word because they just simply skim over the top. They never take the time to dig into the Word of God. When you dig into it, that's where you find the, the, the richness of it and uh, the, the, the wonderful joy and to, to be able to put things in their context and to be able to make relationships uh, between thoughts here and there. And uh, listen, if you're saved, you've got the Holy Spirit as your teacher. And, and don't think that you've got, there, there's nothing wrong with helps. There's nothing wrong with devotionals, study materials. But don't ever forget your greatest teacher is the Holy Spirit. And you can take the Word of God. You can sit down with the Word of God. And you pray and you approach the Word of God with a, with a prayerful attitude. And it's amazing what the Holy Spirit can teach you. Don't ever lose sight of that. Uh, I just want to encourage you in that this morning. Fourth chapter of the book of Philippians. Let's look at the first three verses here. Philippians chapter 4. We may go back tomorrow and pick up some of the same verses we look at this morning. Maybe go a little further. Uh, dealing with the same thought that we look at this morning. We'll see where, how the Lord directs. But in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved. Again, you see uh, the place that they had in the heart of the Apostle Paul. My brethren, dearly beloved and longed for. He said, I want to see you again. I want us to be able to be back together in fellowship, uh, in, um, in body, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. 
I beseech Yodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. And I'm going to stop reading there uh, in verse 3. Now, I want to point out some statements uh, that are made in, in the first verse. And after we do that, what I want to do this morning is try to put the first verse in context with the second and the third verses. And I believe they do go together. But in the first verse, notice what Paul is imploring them concerning. He pleads with them. He says, My brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. What you see here with the Apostle Paul is he's urging these believers in Philippi concerning this thought of steadfastness, to be steadfast. Now, when you think about being steadfast, it just simply means to stand firm. Uh, I always think about the statement Paul made to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain uh, in the Lord. So when you think about being steadfast, it does mean to stand firm. It means to persevere. It means to persist. And uh, y'all know I like to study words. Words have meaning, and I think we need to know the meaning of words. Uh, the opposite of to be steadfast is to quit, is uh, to give up, to cease, uh, to discontinue. But when you think about steadfastness, steadfastness is more than just, and I'm going to use this example, steadfastness is more than just standing out on a clear sunny day and it's calm. Steadfastness has to do with the fact of standing when something's trying to take you down. Steadfastness has to do with standing uh, in the face of, of difficulty, of, of trouble. Uh, Acts chapter 2, when you think about the early church, they said they continued steadfastly. And, and it mentioned four things that they continued steadfastly in. And that just simply means that there was pressure. There was, um, th 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 there was things that were pushing against them to try to cause them uh, to fall. And so Paul here, as he writes to this church, when he encourages them, when he implores them, when he begs them to stand fast, that lets us know there were some things that were putting pressure upon them. There were things that were making it difficult for them to stand fast. There were things that were pushing against them. There were things that, that were, were, were pressuring them to, to fall, to crumble, to walk away, uh, to give up uh, on the work of the Lord. Uh, hold your place here. We're going to come back here. Uh, turn over, if you would, to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Just a few pages over. 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul writes to another group of people that, uh, again, they're, they're dear to him. He's put effort and work there to the uh, church at Thessalonica. And there are some things that have been difficult for them uh, to deal with. And you can read concerning those things earlier in this book, even in the third chapter, uh, uh, about great uh, temptations and trouble that uh, had come upon them. Uh, but when you come down to verse 8, Paul makes a statement here that I want to point out to you. Well, let's, let, let's drop back and read verse 7 too. He said, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress... By what? By your faith. We were comforted concerning you. In all of these things that you've gone through, he said, you stood. You didn't crumble. 
You didn't walk away. You, you, you didn't forsake the Lord. He said, in all these things that we were comforted over you by your faith. And then he makes a statement in verse 8. He says, for now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Let me read that again. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. What he was telling them was this, that we've... We, we've invested so much in you that we've, we've, we've spent and we've, we've been spent and, and, and we've taught and we've seen you grow. And he says this, that it causes great joy and fulfillment unto him because that they have stood fast. They've stood fast. Um, let me use an example. Very few of you here and here this morning are preachers, but most of you are parents. You probably invest more into children than you invest into anything else in your lifetime, don't you? Into your children. You may invest 25 years into a job or 30 years or, or longer than that, but you don't invest in that what you invest in your children. What brings the greatest joy to your heart after you've invested in your children and your children grow up? And they're going to face trouble. They're going to face hardships. They're going to face the storms of life that come their way. But no doubt what causes you the greatest joy as a Christian parent, as a parent that's tried to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, is when they face those things and they do what? They stand fast. Brother Jack, it doesn't sweep them off their feet. It doesn't do them like that house that we read about that Jesus uh, talked about that was built, and yet it was built on a foundation that was unsteady. And when the rains came and the winds blew, that all, it beat upon that house and it fell, and great was the fall of it. No, it does you good that when they're like that other house, because the storms of life are coming and they're going to beat upon them and they stand because they're founded upon that rock, that foundation. And so I believe that's exactly what Paul is speaking of here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 8. He said, there's no greater joy than for me to hear that you've been through the fire, that you've been through the storm, that, that all of these things have come upon you and you've stood. He said, because of that, he said, I live I live because that you stand fast in the Lord. On the other side of that, the flip side, I mentioned the joy when your children stand. It's a devastating thing when you've poured yourself into individuals. You've poured your time, you've poured your effort, you've poured your prayers, you've poured your tears into them. And to see the storm come and see them be swept away. To see them fall from their steadfastness. We're taught in the scriptures that we're, we're instructed not to fall from our own steadfastness. Uh, I tell people sometimes, and it's the truth, I'd rather preach a funeral any day than a wedding. I'll just be honest with you. Now, there's been a few weddings that I have enjoyed performing. I had a young lady come to me just recently and, uh, where I passed her. And she told I knew she'd gotten engaged. and uh, She came to me and she said, you know, we, we'd like for you to perform our wedding and ask if you would. Tell me when it was going to be and it's going to be on, uh, out in the, in, in, the, in the future next year. But, and uh, I smiled. I said, I'd be glad to. And I told, I, I told her this, I, I said, I feel confident that, I won't call their names, but I feel confident that you and your fiancé, that you're not entering into this lightly, that you've prayed about this, you've sought the Lord's will, and 
that uh, you, you're not 99% sure that this is what the Lord wants you to do. You're 100% sure. And, and, and Brother Trina, I just feel like they're, they're going to do well together. I, I feel like that uh, they're, they're, this marriage is on a solid foundation. There's others that <laughs> they ask you to marry them and you just don't have a lot of confidence that it's really the Lord's will. And you, look, I, before I marry somebody, I talk to them, I try to counsel with them, I ask them the questions and they answer them right. But I still wonder, is this thing going to work? Or maybe a, maybe a family, maybe it's a husband and wife that they've had, maybe they've had some trouble and you poured yourself into them. You tried to help them. You counseled with them. You sat down with them maybe over and over and over again and tried to encourage them and tried to point them uh, in the right direction. And Brother Trent, the next thing you hear, they've got a divorce. Can I tell you something this morning? That's devastating as a pastor when, when those things happen. Uh, Y'all know I've, I've got a heart for young people. I've got a heart for teenagers. And uh, because I know how crucial that that time is in their life, that they're coming to a crossroads in their life and they're making some decisions that, that are going to have a great bearing on the rest of their life. But I'm going to tell you something this morning. It's devastating when you have poured yourself into that teenager, that young person, and you see them come to a place and just to choose a different path and to walk away from the Lord. I tell you, that, that just hurts you to the core to see those things. Uh, maybe a family that was once very committed to the work of the Lord. They were faithful. They were dedicated. The Lord was using them. And to see the world begin to pull them away and to see them begin to go that direction and to see them walk away. It's almost, Brother Trent, as if a part of you dies as they leave. Does that make sense? When you pour yourself in uh, to, to people. And so Paul's saying here to these Thessalonians, he said that, that I live, if you live, if you stand fast uh, in the Lord. So let's go back to Philippians chapter uh, 4, where, where we just were. And, and we're going to turn to some other places here in just a moment. But Paul said this in verse 1, he said, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, long for my joy and crown. He said, I'm begging you to stand fast in the Lord. Don't quit him. Don't walk away. Don't get discouraged. Uh, don't leave uh, the, the Lord. Turn over with me to the, hold your place here. Go, go over with me to the book of 2 John. Uh, 2 John. <clears throat> Right before Jude and Revelation. Revelation and back up a few books. Second John, one, one chapter. Don't you notice the statement that uh, John makes here? He writes to, he's written to the elect lady and her children. But in verse 4, John said this. He said, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. He said, I rejoiced when I heard and I found that your children are steadfast. They're continuing to walk in the truth. They hadn't forsaken the Lord. They hadn't apostatized. They hadn't walked away. He said, I find great joy in this. Go over to the next page, the third, uh, in 3 John. Very similar statements that John would make in verse 1. The elder Unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now he's talking here about spiritual children. And that's exactly, we, we use the example of our natural children. And, uh, you know, at least my oldest, he's getting to the point in his life that he's, he's having to make decisions on uh, what he is going to do um, in, in life and which direction, which path that he's going to take. And 
I did. It's new to me. I'll be honest with you. It's new to me. I know that a lot of you have been through that. And it's not easy just to sort of back away and, and, and let them make decisions on their own. Uh, but when they make those wise, godly decisions, isn't it joy? It's joy. And I'm just beginning to experience some of that. And, uh, but, but, but that's what he said here. He said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Uh, I believe Brother Trent would agree with me here that there's places maybe you get to go in revival Maybe you'll go preach a revival, and maybe four or five years later, they'll call you back to preach a revival. And then it goes by, maybe a few years later, you go back to preach a revival. And it's a joy when you see this, it's the same people. It's, they're still there. <laughs> they're still there. Because I guarantee you, in, a, in that period of time, it's not all been just a bed of roses for them. But they've been steadfast. Maybe a church that you pastor and you get to go back. I would say, obviously, that, that's where I am this week. I come back here to, to you that many of you I pastored for a long period of time. And, and I come back here and you're still serving the Lord and, and you're still faithful. And that just does my heart good. I'm telling you, it does my heart good. And so that, uh, the, the, the Paul says here, that you go back to Philippians chapter 4. I know we're jumping around a little bit, but he says, I want you to stand fast. I don't want you to fall away. I don't want you to... To, to, to leave the work. I don't want you to leave the Lord. You can say that a lot of different ways. But let's go down to verse 2 and 3. I said I wanted to try to tie these two passages together. And uh, let me just give you a little tip right quick. As you study the Word of God, don't try to take every verse as a standalone verse. A lot of people do that, and they miss so much. When you read a verse of Scripture, and you, you, maybe you read it, and you go, well, why is this here? What do you need to do? You need to look around it. <laughs> you need to go back, and you need to go forward. Because most of the time, that all these thoughts intertwine. They're all linked together. And that's what we see here in this passage of Scripture, that he, he's, he's begging them to, to stand fast uh, against whatever it is that is discouraging them, whatever it is that's putting pressure on them to, to fall away, to quit, to turn away from the Lord. And then you come to verse 2. And he says, I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help these women, which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Now, do you reckon verse 1 and verses 2 and 3 have anything to do with one another? I think they do. There were some things that were pushing against the believers in Philippi. There were some things that were causing some of them just want to throw their hands up. Brother, Brother Trent, their old knees were getting feeble. And what we find immediately after that is there was a problem in the church. There was a conflict in the church. And that conflict in the church was between two women, wasn't it? One by the name of Yodius and the other Syntyche, if I pronounce that uh, correctly. And these were two women that, that once that these two women, and, and they're believers because it, Paul says in verse 3, their names are in the book of life. They're not lost people. Paul doesn't even think they're lost people. He doesn't say, well, you know, there's a reason why they're fussing and fighting and bickering because they need the Lord. No, he said these are women that they've sort of proven themselves that they haven't made just a profession of faith, but their life's demonstrated that. He talked about these women that they had labored with him in the gospel. They had walked beside him. They, they, they had given themselves diligently the work of the gospel. But Brother Trent, evidently something had come between these two ladies. And he said, I beseech you that you be of the same mind in the Lord. We had some discussions about that true goat fellow, didn't we, Brother Trent? The Sunday school writers meeting. He says here, he, I, I believe that there, there was someone in particular that he was talking about. 
that could, he, he's, he's encouraging them, that true yoke fellow in verse 3, to come in and uh, to, to sort of be a mediator to help these women, to bring them back into a place uh, of, of reconciliation. But evidently that this problem between them, that it had come to the place that it was not only between them anymore, but it was a problem that was affecting the entire body. And I'm going to say this, it was affecting the entire body to a point where the believers in Philippi were becoming discouraged in the work of the Lord. And there were some of them that would just come to the place to say, well, you know what? <laughs> if this is how it is, I'll just go to the house. If this is how it's going to be, maybe they say, I'll just find somewhere else to go. Go back to the book of Matthew, if you will, for just a moment. The book of Matthew, chapter 18. And I know you would know these verses of Scripture very well. But as we tried to get across yesterday, repetition is a good thing. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. He said, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. He said, If, some, if someone's done something to you, he said, don't go, this is Jesus speaking, don't go tell everybody else, but you go to that person. Don't go put it all over Facebook, but go to that person. Don't go run your mouth to everybody else, go to that person. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. That problem, in other words, that, that trespass, that if he'll hear you, if he'll listen, y'all can be reconciled, that the problem's over with. But if he will not hear thee, then take thee one or two more than the mouth of two or three witnesses. Every word may be established. Now, it's important you take the right one or two others. You take the right ones. He said not only that they'd be witnesses. I, I, I believe Brother Trent is also speaking of it. puts a little pressure on them now to do what's right. And then he said if... If he shall neglect to hear them, then tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Speaking of the church, whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done of them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, they are my in the midst of them. Now it's obvious that these two women, Yodius and Syntyche, that they had not taken heed to these instructions. And whatever this problem was uh, that uh, they were having among themselves, it had infiltrated, it was affecting the entire church. People were discouraged, people were dis disheartened, people were getting in place about ready to quit. And I don't know that I don't know this, but I, I believe if you were to ask Yodius and Syntyche about their problem, Brother Hewlin, here, here's what I believe they would have said. Oh, that's no big deal. That's between us. That's between us. This is not a problem that's hurting the church. It's between us. I had a friend several years ago, I, I think I've used this example here in preaching, but it, uh, a dear friend, he's actually a, a, a fellow preacher. Some of you know him. Uh, he was doing some work out in his backyard one day, going to cut a tree down. And uh, he thought he was a little better on the chainsaw than he was. He cut his tree down right across the power line. Took it right down. Of course, his electricity went out. And they li he lived right next to his in-laws and their electricity went out. He looking at the wire. He, he, he realized that, well, that wire comes here and it goes over their house. And he said, well, no, no big deal. That uh, It's just us and them that's without power. So he called the REA, he called the power company, and a couple of hours they come out. And, uh, he was talking to the serviceman. The serviceman 
He goes to one of our churches as well. And he was joking with him about it. And he got, the, he got things back going, got everything fixed. And uh, the preacher told the service man, he said, well, I appreciate you coming out. He said, uh, whew, I'm just glad it was just us. And he called his in-laws names but without power. The service man kind of chuckled. He said, <laughs> uh, there's about 200 without power. You see that he felt like that what he did had only affected him, but it had affected a much larger group of people than he could have ever imagined. When you think about sin this morning, whether that is sin that is uh, a conflict between a brother or sister in Christ, uh, maybe it's just uh, things in our lives that are out of order, uh, in our lives, maybe that we look at that a lot of times and say, well, it only, that, that's between me and the Lord. That's between me and, and, and someone else. But you find here that this conflict between Yodius and Syntyche, it had affected the whole body. And I'm going to tell you something this morning. There's nothing that will drive people away from the church any faster than conflict. Than conflict. Brother Trent, when I first started preaching, I had the raw, I had a misconception about, I, I was thinking the things that cause conflict in the church are big doctrinal issues. It's, you know, it, it's people that, are, that get deceived and they're teaching false doctrine. And I can't think of a conflict since I've been a pastor that had anything really to do over doctrine. You know what it's been about? What this one said to that one? It's over piddling stuff. It's over things that don't amount to a hill of beans, but things people get their feelings hurt over. And they get their feelings hurt. And all of a sudden that, well, the, James, turn to the book of James real quick. The, the book of James chapter 3. James chapter 3. He talks about the tongue and the destructive nature of the tongue. And he uses this example in verse 5. He said, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell he talks about how the, the tongue being such a, a, a little member and how that such a great matter just a little fire will kindle as maybe someone gets their feelings hurt some somebody gets crossed up with somebody else and it starts out as something so small that brother Trent can be handled so easily and so quickly and yet what you see before long is it's affected the whole body it's affected the whole body it's got people discouraged. It's got people taking sides. And you say, well, preacher, it ought not to be that something as piddling as a conflict between two people would cause Christians to fall from their steadfastness. I agree with that 100%. It ought not to be that way. But I'm going to tell you something. Every person in the church is not a strong Christian, are they? There's some that are, that are weaker. There's some that... Uh, they get swept off of their, their feet. Uh, they, they get discouraged uh, very, very uh, quickly. Um, in the book of Hebrews, I won't turn over and read it, verse 12, it talked about a root of bitterness. It springs up, and who does it defile? Many. It says it defiles many. Achan, I thought about Achan and his sin. You could go back and you read in Joshua uh, chapter 7. It was one man that decided, you know, he saw a goodly Babylonian garment and he coveted it. He took it and the gold and the silver. And no doubt that he thought, well, this affects nobody but me. Where was the next place they went? It was to Ai. How many men died at Ai? 36 men? 36 different families were affected by Achan's sin. 36 families. And then he and his own, his, his sons, his daughters, his whole family was affected when it finally came down and was determined that he was the one uh, who was 
uh, guilty. This morning, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, not going to go any further. I'm going to close. But I want to encourage us in this this morning. We need to see just how precious and how important and how dear that the church truly is. To love the church, to see the beauty of the church, to see the necessity of the church, and to see the church is much more important than my feelings. The church is much more important than my pride. It's much more important than, than, than me winning the battle, than me getting the last laugh. Oh, the church. There's one thing a lot of times that keeps me where I need to be. Maybe when I get upset. You're going to get upset about things in the church from time to time. You'll get crossed up with people from time to time. But one of the things that keeps me in line, Brother Trent, is to remember that the church has the message of the gospel. The church is the one who's empowered and authorized to preach the gospel message and to know that if I don't handle this the right way, that's going to be detrimental to the church. And in turn, that's detrimental to sinners. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want to do anything to be a stumbling block that would hurt or hinder people from coming to the Lord. I don't want to do anything to be a stumbling block to cause maybe weak Christians to say, well, if that's what it's all about, I don't want, anything, I want to have a part of it. And they forsake the Lord. Maybe they raise their children outside of the church. And maybe for generations to come, that because of my foolishness and my pride, that many, many people will be affected. He said, he beseeched these women to be in the same mind in the Lord and for others to help them. Would you bow with me this morning? Heavenly Father, take the message, the study. Cleanse it from my errors and blunders. You know, even the, maybe even the scattered nature of it this morning. But I know that you can take it and you can use it as you so desire. And Heavenly Father, I pray that we would never be guilty by our actions of causing others to become discouraged, of others to fall from their own steadfastness. And I pray that we could love you, we could love the church as you love it. You gave yourself uh, for it. Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for those that are, are faithful to the church. Uh, thankful for those that are dedicated, committed. Thank you for their dear pastor. Continue to strengthen them as they work and labor together in this community. I know Satan desires to cause division, to cause confusion. He desires to get in any way that he can. May we commit. May we draw nigh to the Lord. And may Satan not be able to have a inroad through our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You have something in your heart, you feel free.